and a warm welcome to today's video on 3D projection mapping in anime. This is an effect that can give life to 2D animation and especially 2D background art where you really need that 3D camera movement, right? So in real life where you've got a camera that can move uh, not only in an X and Y angles, right? Top, down, left, right. We need that camera movement to go inwards and outwards or even change angles and so on. So this effect actually allows you to get that 2D art and sort of make it a little bit more 3D. So the best way to show this off is actually by showing you a video of this in practice. So the example I'm going to show you today is from a 2002 video game by Konami uh, called Suikoden 3. So what this tells you, right, is that this effect uh, is not something new. It's not something modern. It's been around for some decades. And it was even used in Princess Mononoke, which is a production from 1997. So I'm not sure why this hasn't really been picked up by studios over the decades. I think it's really easy to set up, um, especially as compared to other forms of 3D modeling. And even in scenes where it's 2D, you can you can get that extra three, that third dimension um, with very little work and increase that production value quite a lot, right? Um, so anyway, without further ado, let's just, um, run through the video, um, some seconds of the clip and I'll break down the effect and what we see. So there's no audio just for, um, copyright purposes. All right, so you can probably tell me um, which of those two scenes uh, was using 3D projection mapping. But let's go back and break these down. So the first scene um, is kind of a very far shot, um, wide shot, uh, of these planes against the cliff and a man on his uh, dog horse thing, a uh, fantasy mystical creature. Um, so what we can actually see is that the camera is looking to the right um, and it's not too far away from them. And then in 3D space, we're moving backwards. It's rotating to the left. We got that tilt in there and that shot is really dynamic. So that shot, um, if we limited ourselves to 2D animation, the best you could have get, gone out of that was to have the camera just move from the left to the right and just zoom out, so zooming out a really static linear in a linear fashion. And this just would not be possible without this um, projection mapping technique. Now, uh, the specifics of it is a lot more noticeable <clears throat> in the second use. So you can actually see that um, parts of the grass that's further away from the camera along the cliff edge is moving a lot slower than everything at the front. And this is kind of that parallax effect that you actually get in real life and out of um, cameras and live action things and things that are 3D. Um, so that gives so much more dynamic to what's happening on screen than if it was just a large 2D image that was just flat panning. Um, so by using this effect, you really greatly enhance it. And <clears throat> if I was to put a time estimate on this with a pretty amateur a guy with pretty amateur 3D modeling skills like myself, um, I would say you could have achieved this in about 20 minutes or half an hour, um, which is really quite uh, cheap in the sense of a production. So, so basically, um, the purpose of making this video is to actually break down this effect in a lot of detail because I want um, people to know exactly how it can be done. Um, because I think that one of the reasons this effect isn't used so much is probably because there's kind of a lack of awareness or um, lack of the, the know-how uh, knowledge, right? Um, so I've just spent time experimenting today and there's probably much better ways of doing it. Um, and there's some ways that I'm thinking of actually achieving this um, effect quite autonomously um, with some of the technologies that we have today. Um, but anyway, um, I think the best place to start is go down um, to the basics. So I'm talking a lot about projection 
and in this case it's specifically UV um, UV projection. So how UV projection works in um, 3D modeling is that we grab all these different vertices. So each one of these corners is a vertice. Um, and these are all in 3D space, right? These are all 3D space. We've got three vectors. What we're actually doing is translating them or mapping them into a 2D space. So basically, um, for each one of these points, they're actually mapped and flattened down into a 2D space. So this square here and its four vertices might be these four in the middle and the ones next to it over to the right and all the adjacent faces will be adjacent in the UV mapping as well, if you're following good practice, that is. Um, I have seen some anime where they just, the UV maps are just not good. Um, and uh, essentially what you can do with this UV map is get an image and wrap it on that 3D model. So you're casting that 2D image and you're rolling it around the 3D model um, so that you can give much more detail in that object than you would with just the base colors out of <clears throat> every single face. So you're adding details to the mesh without physically adding that detail in the geometry. Now this is really important into understanding um, this effect um, and how it can basically be done so easily, right? So if we, um, so in that video where you had the planes and you had the rocks, you didn't have to model every single um, rock and crack and crevice in each one of those. You could have just made a blob and the details have been filled in by the image anyway. <clears throat> so another way to look at this is by looking at this cube example. So um, essentially this cube here has been textured as we can see on the left side. Um, what you, what the UV map is doing is basically is it's rolling that mesh out, flattening it out into a net. Um, and this is a very basic example, like a human model when you flattened out actually looks quite disgusting, right? It's, it's just like if you were to grab your skin, slice between your arms there and peel the skin out and put it onto a flat area, that's what a UV map looks like. Um, so if you want some horror, um, you can go and look at some... Uh, textures out of video games of human characters but essentially um so each one of these uh squares is um mapped into the cube so each one of these faces will have a unique texture space so you could have the image uh, you could have like the text one on this face and that will appear made perhaps i think it will, it will appear on this face up here and you could have two over on this side where my cursor is and the, the, the word two have been marked here. So that's kind of how um, UV maps are done in a traditional sense. So basically the way it's meant to be done and the best practice is that you've got conformity in the sort of the texture density so that the image is mapped evenly and it's distributed well across the whole model. So that the detail is there and you don't have any more things. So here we've got really clean checkers and you don't have any zigzag or patterns where it's just all swirly and those sort of things right like it's um perfectly mapped out now what we're doing instead with this technique is we're actually exploiting uv mapping quite heavily so what we're doing is projecting that uv space so we're grabbing these vertices and rather than displaying them flat we're actually projecting them from the view of a camera. So there's this example by Rich Sedman, which he did for a user in Blender, um, which is really great. So here in the top right quadrant, what we see is a is the texture being overlaid on the camera. So this texture is in the camera space, and it's being cast onto each one of these models behind it as a direct line. So each one of these pixels is going directly to where that pixel hits on the model in 3D space. So you can see um, on the left-hand side here that the texture is actually getting quite distorted, especially on the edges where the camera is sort of looking outwards, right? So the further away from where you are or where the camera is, 
<clears throat> the more stretched out and everything will be. But what this means is that the texture is mapped like every pixel is mapped um, in the space of the camera. So the effects that we're going through uh, with this one is actually by moving the camera around, you can actually sort of adjust, um, you know, how it looks in 3D, 3D space without severe distortion of everything. And it actually works out a lot better if you want a more traditional look, but with that 3D movement, but without going into full 3D models and with where textures might just be cartoonized and with cell shading and those sort of things. And it will never look um, perfect, to be blunt. Um, but this can really get around that. And it's a whole lot easier um, to paint these details than it is to individually model these trees, these bushes, the, the grassland and everything. Um, and the texturing, you'll notice the tiles and everything. So using this method um, is really good. And I'm what I'm going to do now is take you over to Blender to get a working example of this. Okay, so I'm going to run through this demo um, two ways. So first off, I'm going to show you a, a finished example uh, by a pretty rough one um, of this scene taken out of non non Biotti. So I actually just uh, exported a screenshot from the anime and um, put into Blender and applied uh, all of the UV mapping using the projection method um, to some meshes, which are uh, some basic block outs of the elements in the scene. So um, just to look at you, look at the effect. So I am in the preview right now um, and I'm just going to move the camera around. So I just need to select something on the screen. So I'm gonna go zoom in and I'm gonna zoom out. So we can see that there's actually um, that perspective distortion along the edges. Uh, rather than just a basic zoom, because this is all 3D models, right? So we can actually see things in the foreground is zooming uh, much quicker than everything else in the background. And what we can see is even things along the edge here, like we can see there's this little light bit of dirt. If I move to the right, we can see that's getting clipped off because this is a separate 3D mesh from everything um, below it. So... Um, with about 20 minutes of work, uh, it's not perfect, but we've got some basic panning that we can do like that. Um, we could even go like that. Oh, we could even go, you know, <laughs> um, sideways uh, like that and back down again and so forth. So let's see what happens when you go on a completely drastically different camera angle. So let's escape and let's have a look at all the really nice distortion. So we can see um, something similar to that Blender screenshot I showed earlier from Stack Exchange. We've got a lot of things in the foreground um, with a high pixel density because those things are close to the camera and all the other parts of the images are getting stretched amongst a much greater um, um, area. So yeah, so these 3D models are essentially, for example, the road is kind of placed like how it would be in real life, except rather than having a texture of a road, it's tiling and it's quite boring. We've got all of that dynamic detail that's put in a painting that's very realistic. So I doubt that you would get something with um, very similar details without a whole lot more effort um, in a 3D space by using full 3D models rather than this projection method. So um, some artifacts that you can get out of using this method if you go way too far, not only does it just completely break when you move around like that, um, uh, using the way that I did, you may end up with some duplication of objects because um, of course in a 2D image, there is no data behind objects that are cut that 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 aren't, don't exist in the original image, right? So the whatever's behind this ledge here just does not exist, and henceforth you get the effect here, or the artifacting. But um, that aside, that's where I think we could be using 
sort of content fill or content awareness to get around those um, small issues, uh, you know, through some automation um, that I'm thinking of uh, developing. But yeah, so anyway, that's a little bit of what you can do. Um, I'm sure that um, by using some other images or something um, a bit more like the plants that we saw before, um, quite quickly we can get out a working example. So I'm actually going to go source one right now, and we're going to model this out and do all the projection and everything inside of Blender real time so that you guys can get a really good example if you want to stick around for that. Okay, so now that I've sourced the uh, image that we're going to use um, for the actual implementation demo, um, let's get right into it. So this, um, of course, is using Blender. So um, one of the first things that we can do is actually get the image that we want to projection map um, to actually be displayed within the camera. So if we go to the camera object, head down to the little camera button, what we can do is um, tick on background images, add image, <clears throat> and just open it up. Um, you can't see it on the screen, but I've put the file explorer here. Um, so I'm going to add in the image. This one I've actually sourced from Attack on Titan. So um, now that I've got my image loaded, uh, you can actually preview this um, in the camera by pressing, if you've got the normal mappings, um, zero on your number pad. And we can see that behind everything, the image is right there, nice and square on in the view. <clears throat> so um, one of the first things we'll do is remove the standard cube and we'll add in a flat plane to start with. So I'm going to scale up um, the plane quite a bit. And what we're going to do is head right over into modeling. Um, set ourselves to wireframe, go back here. Now I should mention as well, um, Blender has pretty low view mode limitations to begin with as far as, far as um, the extent of objects goes with distance. So what I'm going to do is um, head over into the view tab, set the view, let's just set it to like 10 kilometers. It could be literally anything. Um, it's not as if we have millions of objects. So what we'll do is go into camera, jump out into object mode for a second um camera <clears throat> this one yeah this one the clipping ends at 100 meters i mean come on so we'll need to set it um to about 10 kilometers and head back in from object mode into edit mode so what you want to do now is really set up the camera to make sure that the uh field of view and the sort of height and distance of things is correct so this flat plane is going to be a measure for um, a lot of the foreground um, grass and dirt right so what we need to do is try and match up the angles of how everything looks um, so I'm purposely going to make the square a little bit smaller and I'm going to ex expand this a little bit along the edges but just going to set up the view how I think it's set up now, um, I think we're pretty good, but on some, you might end up having a situation where the field of view is different. So if we just head back into object mode quickly, so we can get to the camera settings, the focal length here is what you want to change. So you might want to reduce that um, or expand that. So generally by reducing it means that things that are close to the camera will be drastically more distorted with perspective rather than if you have the the focal length set to something higher um, is, is a general rough guide for things. So I actually think by setting it to 50 millimeters um, and shifting this back, we're actually probably about right. <clears throat> so let me just, no, that's not good. Let's do that. And I think we're about, yeah, I think we're about good. So I'll leave it at that for now. Um, so what we want to do with this plane, I'm going to actually just align it a little bit more to how it's um, how the field is set up. So what I think we'll need to do with this is there's a hard edge in where the plane clips, um, oh, and going well where this hill clips, and 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 we see the next one, right? So I'm going to try and align this edge to go sharp along there, so we can get the camera movement to go down, 
and we're not going to have any weird distortion or anything. So let's go to more duplication of things. So let me do this, um, where we'll extend this out. Now, a good thing to set the transform orientations to local. It's a little bit easier. Just get a rough guide for where um, things will be for now. You can also just zoom in and out like that if need be. So I think probably, yeah, leave it at that for now. Along this edge, go down like this um, and move it up a little bit. <clears throat> now, what we need to do is always make sure that the meshes always go right to the very end of the image. Otherwise, it'll be parts of the parts of it where it's not actually mapped to anything. Um, <clears throat> so what we need to do now is probably start looking at subdividing everything. So I'm just going to subdivide along these two edges so that we can split it up this way first. So I'm going to do edge subdivide. Do it a couple of times. Yeah, that should be fine. Now what we'll do is move these along a little bit. <clears throat> So just move the x-axis. And just try to align them as close as you can. You won't get it perfect today, but maybe in a production sense, you might want to try and get this as good as you can. Um, typically, I would say that I would be exporting these out as different layers if you're if you're actually creating the source artwork for this, um, but still map everything out, right? So that um, you still have your really nice soft stroked corners um, or edges to things, right? Because we're going to have a hard edge along here, but if I was actually the, the person creating the source art, separate it out into different layers um, and export it that way, and then each one of these planes will be the... You know, have their own image um this part of what i want to do with the content awareness so that this can be done after the fact right so you might have the background art um, supplied by an external company but you can still manage to do all these effects like you want without their direct um <clears throat> without direct interference on their end so now that that's there um that will work kind of basically but we've got things like these rocks in here where we might want to have it a little bit lumpy so this is kind of where you just find out what exact parts of the mesh you need to subdivide. So let's go and subdivide this. doesn't matter if you shift these around like that and so on. Um, yes. Edge subdivide. And I'm just going to actually subdivide all of that up quite a bit. Okay, so now with a plane. I'm just going to shift these up a little bit, right? So that when removing this stuff, is there's going to be some effect to the positioning of these little lumpy parts. And we'll probably want to do the same with this little rock over here. So I'm going to subdivide again. Let's get that quiet size. And let's subdivide this down. Uh, it's going to be way too hard to work with for now. So just do it like that. So what I might do is actually subdivide along here. So I'm not showing you exactly like what's the right or the wrong way, but just an example of how you can get to this result. Um, obviously, you can refine this process as much as you need um, or tweak it for your purposes. <clears throat> you, the, the other way of doing this might be is to just start out with a high resolution uh, mesh and then you do all of the stuff through um, sculpting and so on. So that's probably um, maybe even a better way of doing it. But we'll just stick to this for now, just so I can show you the what what we're going to end up with with this technique. OK, 
Okay, so I'm going to sub, 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 sub divided. Now, um, on a stuff like planes and that, I would suggest that you don't that you try not to have these vertices to overlap. Otherwise, it's going to be missing data behind that point. And if your camera moves a little bit too high, um, you're going to notice that there's some bizarre um, UV mapping going on behind it. So, yeah, I would try not to have it so extreme that it's just going beyond all the faces um, behind it. Because already at this point, the pixel density is going to be very low and stretched along those faces down there. So I think we'll leave that at um, that point for the um, front mesh. Now let's start implementing the one for the um, <clears throat> for the next row. Actually, you know, it's going to be very hard with those trees there. So <laughs> this is one of the things that'll be great if you um, if the, a background artist has done the three D um, has separated down to different layers, or if you use some sort of content aware filling to sort of fill in what would be behind it, and using an algorithm to sort of slice out. Um, between the trees but for now let's just um, add in another plane just set this to be lower than your current plane make it a lot bigger because we know that it's quite far away right quite low quite far away okay so let's rotate this around so it's a little bit kind of goes around the edge of the hill a little bit better and i think just for the purpose of summer we'll leave it at that when we'll see what we get so what i'm going to do um then right is you might have your very very end background images what you can do is just get a plane um rotate it so it's completely facing you just go 90 degrees here, extend that out, try to make it at least facing towards you a little bit. Okay, so now we've got our base meshes in and it looks quite weird. Um, what you want to do here is make sure that, that the meshes are in complete order. So it feels like that would be missing half the hill, something you can't see too well in the wireframe. So what I'll do is shift that back out. Um, and then rescale it again. So I can see that's even... Ah, it's behind the second one there. <laughs> so we'll extend that out again. That should be fine. So going back um, to our wireframe, we've got everything here. So what we'll need to do now is actually go into edit mode and um, start subdividing this up really well. So essentially, um, even though that there not, might not be that much geometry that's affected and manipulated, um, it will need to be subdivided quite heavily uh, because the UV mapping is going to try and project to the nearest pixel or the nearest vertice. Like it's going to try and protect, get a, a um, pixel from the image, get to the closest vertice. So um, you're going to have some distortion or heavy distortion if it's a low poly count. So um what i'm gonna do here is actually just triangulate the face because i want to make sure that everything is fairly decent um and we'll just start subdividing to something crazy right like just go 20 for now um what we'll do is just to clean up decimate geometry a little bit so we can just try and even out um this ratio a little bit i think so that's fine Let's start subdividing again. Um, yeah, that should be good. So what we'll do then is grab the second plane and we'll need to apply the same thing. Even as far away, we need that because remembering that the pick that the mesh should be based on the pixel destiny, uh, pixel uh, density. Let's go and do this again. Now this one's gonna be very easy to subdivide. I'm gonna go 100, right? And it's not going to be enough, so I'm going to do it again. So I'm going to go edge, subdivide, uh, one. That should be fine. Same thing for this final mesh at the end here. So I'm going to go edge, subdivide. Oops. Edge, subdivide, 100. And do it once more. Uh, ah, just 
edge subdivide. Which that's quite high, but I'm not really concerned. So what we'll do then is start actually projecting the UVs onto these meshes. But before we do that even, um, <laughs> let's go into shading and actually make a material for these meshes. Um, and even before that, let's go into modeling. Let's go face, shade smooth. Let's make sure all these are smoothed out. Okay. So in the material, I'm going to add in a new one and call this BG Matte. It can be whatever you want to call it. Call it something meaningful. Going to go into the shading section. Delete this principal BSDF mode. Um, so remembering that this material doesn't need any sort of processing to it apart from just passing the raw RGB values to the screen because the the paint the painting is already um, the colors that we need. We don't need to apply any shading to it, right? So let me just grab the original image. <clears throat> Chuck it in and just connect the color up to the surface. And we'll just want to reuse the material. Don't create a new one. Um, not that good practice. So just use the existing ones. So right now, um, because the mapping is flat, of course, um, it's unusable at the moment, right? So that's when our UV mapping comes into play. So I'll head over to the UV editing mode. And what I'm going to do is go UV. So no, you can do it from the modeling section. I'm going to go UV project from view. And we can already see that one there is good. So let's do the next one. UV project from view. Great. Last one. Modeling control A UV project from view. Great. So everything looks like it's matching up. Um, so now let's go into. So now I'm interacting with the camera and I'm going in and we're getting a bit of movement there, right? So that looks pretty cool. Like that right there is a great um, zoom that we're getting. And you can go down and up. So we, so the camera, right? Okay, so we don't want to go that far because it's so duplicating. But what you might want to do is panning shot where we kind of go a little bit lower. So you can go kind of down like that and you can get, you can get quite a cool effect. So if you had a much taller image, much taller sky, you could actually go and completely almost start looking at almost going flat, right? So you can go up to about that point. Um, yeah, so if you've got a high res image, you could probably even go like that. Um, probably panning left to right works really well. And you can tell that this, um, yeah, that, you know, once you, um, if you have, if you have a little bit of, bit of blurring along the edges there, uh, which could take a bit of time, um, to, you know, merge between these two, then we could end up with something that actually looks like this is all very one piece, um, with that little bit of view so it just makes a 3d painting more um, dynamic lively um, and so on it's gone way too far off the edge but yeah so this is kind of like a little crash course um, into the example of course we need the good source um, art to make a really good example of this um, I'm not a background artist I'm not a painter uh, I can kind of do some 2d characters but um, yeah, so <laughs> I've had to uh, make do with what I have for this example. Okay, so uh, sorry, just ended pretty uh, disruptly at the end there. Um, I decided to ramble on for a few minutes, but I just want to summarize um, some of the points. So the purpose of making these videos is to sort of give some light um, into some of these effects that you can do um, for anime with 3D. 
while not having to totally go into a full 3D production mode, which is quite expensive for some studios. And when they go do kind of go in that direction, um, sometimes it, it's not necessarily implemented properly because um, they just don't have some of um, the time that's required. Um, what I think I would like to do is perhaps make a, a video series more focusing around UV mapping um, and some of the issues that I've seen um, with anime with that because it's one of the core principles of modeling but it is a really big pain and especially when you're um, low on time so just to make a video series on how what's some really quick ways to work around um, some of these issues knowing fully that um, in the anime industry you aren't necessarily paid that well and you're on huge time constraints but if you have some of the skills to do this really quickly um, then that's a really big benefit and you're going to get much better quality um, for your time and resources. But um, yeah, so that's basically uh, it for me for this video. I hope you enjoyed it and good on you for sticking um, here up until this point. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again in the next video. Thank you and have a good night.